Chapter 11 is dedicated to the peculiar institution, so American slavery. There is a reason that there is an entire chapter dedicated to the system of slavery because it very much shaped the economy of the United States in the market revolution period, and it solidified itself as King Cotton in the South after Eli Whitney's invention. We've already discussed a lot of this. And not only did it shape the economy, but it shaped and entrenched itself so deeply in the South that the Civil War was almost inevitable. The first thing I want you to take a look at is this map from the textbook. And make note to yourself that uh, South Carolina ends up being the very first state to secede before the Civil War. And if you look at the slave population in 1860, you can see population density of slaves. And although there is a significant number of slaves in uh, eastern Virginia, for example, you have just as much um, practically no slaves in western Virginia, um, which honestly would explain why in the middle of the Civil War the uh, people of western Virginia actually declared themselves independent from the Confederacy and rejoined the Union and the bo new border of Virginia and West Virginia forms right about there. And um, that split was very much a result of the divide in Virginia over slavery. So back to the point I was making about the predominance of slavery in uh, eastern Virginia. Virginia, if you remember back to John Rolfe and the bringing of tobacco seeds to the New World, John Rolfe and tobacco um, ended up long term exhausting the soil of Virginia. So a lot of the tobacco plantations in Virginia and even into North Carolina um, had exhausted the soil in such a bad way that there's a time period actually known as the Middle Passage in which slaves are being sold out of what's known as the Upper South or the Old South, which is really everywhere north of uh, South Carolina and parts of Tennessee. So uh, north of this line that I just drew, you have um, some pretty exhausted uh, soils, and that's known as the Upper South or the Old South. And um, you go through a time period of uh, what's known as the Second Middle Passage. And we're going to go through this in detail in just a little bit. But the shift um, of slave population from these areas of exhausted soil into what's known as the Deep South, the Lower South, or the New South. Um, and you can see, especially South Carolina, and the slave population there. What else do we remember about South Carolina? Well, I'll take a few notes here off to the side. If you remember, South Carolina um, held up negotiations on the Declaration of Independence. They held up negotiations on the Constitution of the United States and all over the issue of slavery. Then, if you remember, we just recently covered this period of uh, Western expansion and uh, the Jacksonian period, and they led the way on nullification as well. So you have South Carolina 
at the forefront of nearly every controversy that happens between the federal and state governments and the issue of federal supremacy versus states' rights. So South Carolina, keep that in your mind, that they are really the uh, centerpiece of uh, sectional conflict. So more discussion on uh, the second middle passage. If you look at slave populations in 1790 versus 1860, yes, you could still see these uh, deep colorations in Virginia and North Carolina. Uh, it's not that Virginia and North Carolina are not uh, dependent on slavery. Uh, to some certain degree, they very much are. But if you look at the deep colorations in what comes to be known as the Deep South, the Lower South, the New South, um, how much darker that is than really the only dark coloration in 1790 is this coastal region of South Carolina. Um, slavery absolutely exploded um, due to, obviously, the cotton gin, among other things. Um, but like I said before, Virginia's soil has been exhausted um, and new lands in the Deep South are being cultivated. Uh, and if you think about global demand for cheap cotton, the fact that lots of Native Americans have been removed from this uh, land, L look at uh, Georgia here and remember our Worcester versus Georgia decision that we discussed. The way has been cleared here for King Cotton and the Cotton Kingdom, uh, the profits from uh, cotton crops, and a lot of the slaves that were in the Old or Upper South get sold into uh, the Deep South, particularly uh, South Carolina, Georgia, Alabama, the Mississippi River Valley, uh, parts of the Tennessee River Valley, um, and this, if you were to give it a number, is approximately 2 million slaves are sold into the Deep South from the Upper South. Uh, Thomas Jefferson, actually, at the tail end of his life, he uh, made his living selling slaves. His plantation was no longer as productive as it once was, and he actually uh, lived his retirement years, shall we say, uh, by selling off his slave holdings. Um, you could see this photograph. This is also something I, I pulled out of the textbook. Um, this is a slave dealer's place of business in Atlanta. Um, this is just a regular part of the southern economy. Um, almost every town of a decent size had uh, slave auction site or multiple slave auction sites. So the Upper South, uh, despite things that you see in movies um, and uh, books and, and pop culture that covers uh, this antebellum period of history, antebellum Latin for before the big war, um, there's not a lot of cotton plantations in the Upper South, like Virginia and North Carolina. Tobacco crops, like I've said over and over, long since depleted the soil to the point where they really uh, didn't have near the uh, plantation productivity that they once did. Um, now, the Lower South, the Deep South, on the other hand, is completely dependent on cotton production. There um, is a reason that the southern states secede nearly immediate, immediately after Lincoln gets elected. While the upper south um, hesitated, they were unsure. States like Delaware, Maryland, Kentucky, Missouri, they refused to secede at all because they are not nearly as dependent on slavery as these deep southern states. Um, Virginia, as a matter of fact, does not secede until after the firing on Fort Sumter in South Carolina. So, um, for one side, there's absolutely no choice because uh, their only bread and butter, shall we say, to their economy was to continue 
taking advantage of the slave system. Um, so again, size of slaveholding is also an indicator of just how dependent on slavery uh, folks are. Um, you can see the average number of slaves per slaveholding. So 20 plus, you are firmly in the planter class. We discussed this in our phoner assignment where what did it mean to be part of the planter class? You were uber rich. You were like the Bill Gates or Jeff Bezos of uh, plantation owners if you had 20 or more slaves. And if you had um, into maybe 100 slaves, you were just the elite of the elite. And um, it is more common, however, to have uh, fewer in number. But you can see uh, the colorations, again, showing the Deep South having much more dependence on slavery and the wealthy planter class uh, where they were concentrated and therefore where they would be most resistant to any uh, resistance to slavery. You see major crops of the South. So again, the Upper South, this is all predominantly tobacco. And you got to remember too, particularly in the regions um, that had been planting tobacco a lot longer than others, uh, Virginia and North Carolina, they have long since exhausted their soil. Kentucky, Tennessee, Missouri, they still have viable soil to plant uh, tobacco, uh, whereas the formerly deeply dense enslaved population areas like Virginia and North Carolina, they're selling all of their slave holdings into uh, the deeper south where cotton production is becoming much more um, predominant. Uh, and that's the green coloration here, cotton production. You can see some rice production uh, along the coast in North Carolina and Georgia. Um, you can see some sugarcane production in Louisiana. Um, and there should be some coloration of sugar production here in Florida too, even though there isn't. Um, but the absolute dominant crop is uh, cotton. So a majority of white Southerners, actually an overwhelming majority, 75%, were members of the lower class and didn't own a single slave. That means that only 25% of the population owned slaves. Wow. Um, planters control most of the quality land. So lower class whites live in the hilly regions. This is where the nickname hillbilly comes from. Um, and those hilly re regions are unsuitable for plantations. So they are working the land to raise their own food uh, using family labor. Um, a good uh, depiction of what a hillbilly is, if you watch the uh, History Channel uh, docudrama series uh, Hatfields and McCoys and Kevin Costner and Bill Paxton are two actors that play the two sides and um, these folks are hillbillies. Uh, one of the first things that they argue about in the film and their family feud roots from is someone is accused of stealing another's pig. Um, and so they're, they're raising animals, they're raising crops, really for their own subsistence, and they do not own slaves. Uh, one of them is, in fact, a defector from the Confederate Army because he does not want to continue fighting for something that clearly doesn't benefit him. Um, so these hillbillies, they are usually very desperately poor. Uh, they are really just subsiding, and they don't really buy any manufactured goods from stores. They're producing a lot of their own stuff. Uh, very similar if you go back to the concept of homespun during the revolution. Um, this is exactly the kind of social divide, like I said before, that led to West Virginia to break away from Virginia uh, during the Civil War, as I pointed out on the map earlier. So these lower class whites, they sometimes if you had a decent, good paying job, you're an overseer for a rich plantation owner. Um, or you patrol the countryside for runaway slaves and you get bounties, handsome bounties for bringing these slaves back to their owner. Um, and sometimes they even rent 
slaves from plantation owners from time to time to do work on their farms. Um, most lower class whites believe that their freedom depended upon slavery and regularly elect the rich planter class men to public office to represent them. And remember what we talked about in class, this is almost psychologically ingrained in them. Uh, it's not almost, it is psychologically ingrained in them because if blacks were to be free, they were to become uh, regular citizens, these poor white hillbillies are thinking to themselves, well, wait a minute, I'm lower class. Those, those people will be my equals. And because of the, the uh, race psychology of that time period, that was considered dishonorable, embarrassing. They couldn't even imagine a world in which blacks were their equal. So even though they did not benefit in any way, shape, or form from the slave system, they are actually kept in a permanent, uh, deeply, desperately poor underclass that they uh, still continue to support these rich planter class men even into the Civil War. A good majority of the men who fought and died for the Confederate military did not own a single slave. You see a photo here depicting these hillbillies with their modest home uh, living in the hill country. Um, so this is an upcountry family dressed in their homespun clothing in Cedar Mountain, Virginia, which is in the mountainous country northwest of Richmond. And these folks are very, very, very isolated from the market economy. Again, they do a lot of their own homespun and homemade goods. The planter class. So we, we've already discussed this. I already went back over this uh, in a couple of the slides here. But if you were going to be a part of uh, the planter class, you um, needed to own 20 or more slaves. Um, that's fewer than 40,000 families, which 40,000 seems like a big figure, but just how deeply entrenched the slave system is in the South, that's actually not that big of a figure. Then you see fewer than 2,000 families own 100 or more slaves. So these are the people, like I said before, these are your like Bill Gates, Jeff Bezos type rich, whereas uh, these folks are very wealthy, don't get me wrong, they're, they're living more than comfortably, but they aren't quite as elite as those that have a hundred or more. Um, now, despite being the few, the elite planters control nearly everything. Um, they, uh, it's funny though, as rich as they are, it's almost like somebody who wins the lottery and you find out they're broke a couple years later. Um, they spend their money very lavishly. Um, you see a lot of the plantation houses with fancy Greco-Roman architecture, um, fancy imported clothes and goods. Uh, some of them had expensive gambling or drinking habits. Actually, the gambling is uh, very well depicted in the miniseries Roots. Um, one of the characters is uh, uh, very heavily in debt due to gambling on uh, cockfighting, so roosters get thrown into a pen and whoever's rooster kills the other wins. Um, I know that sounds kind of silly, but um, very uh, popular form of gambling back then. Now, with the international slave trade outlawed and the cultivation of land for cotton uh, exploding in the South, the price of slaves rose way above and beyond the ability for lower class whites to make their very first investment in slaves. So not only uh, we discussed how um, big plantations would buy out struggling smaller farms, and that is uh, absolutely something that had been going on since uh, even the colonial period, let alone uh, the early Republic of the United States. But it only accelerated when the price of slaves after the international slave trade, uh, when those prices went up, it just accelerated that trend. You can see uh, this painting. Again, this comes from the textbook. And um, it's an 1861 painting, so just as the Civil War is getting underway. And you can see that this is such a rich household that not only do they have slaves 
uh, working in the fields while they uh, comfortably ride uh, their horses for entertainment outside of their extremely fancy uh, Greco-Roman architecture, like I mentioned before, plantation home. But you see off to the side, they have even more slaves that are working inside of their very own sugar mill. Okay, so this is in Louisiana. This is a self-sustaining empire of sugar production. So they not only grow the sugar cane, they harvest it and process it in their own sugar mill. So this is one of those uh, Bill Gates, Jeff Bezos type uh, rich plantation owners. The concept of Southern honor, this, this help ex helps explain uh, why the lower classes uh, supported uh, the slaveocracy. And that is because it, it seemed a threat to their honor if blacks were to be considered their equal. Uh, both upper and lower class whites uh, adhered to this code of personal honor. Um, you're expected to defend with deadly violence if necessary. Dueling is very common if someone has insulted your honor. Um, you are supposed to protect your reputation and that of your family. Uh, so, like I said, dueling, even though it's illegal, uh, prominent Southerners still took part in duels uh, very uh, often that uh, were often because of somebody having uh, insulted their reputation or their honor. Um, so here's a uh, drawing that depicts uh, uh, teasing about Southern chivalry. Um, this man here is uh, Senator Charles Sumner of Massachusetts, and he was giving an anti-slavery speech when a congressman from the House of Representatives, not even a part of that political body of the Senate, he was uh, sitting in the audience, and he came out and beat Charles Sumner over the head unconscious with his cane. This is uh, Preston Brooks, uh, congressman, and guess where he's from? South Carolina. And you can see people in the background, they are likely uh, also uh, Southerners. Here's a couple of men that are smiling and laughing at Sumner's getting beaded. This man looks to be pumping his fist and celebrating Sumner getting beaten. And Preston Brooks, as much as he is, is beating an innocent man uh, with a uh, cane, he uh, would be doing this to defend Southern honor, in his opinion. So, fewer white Southerners actually... Um, share the view of the Founding Fathers that slavery was at best a necessary evil. They knew it was wrong, but they just knew it was a, it was a necessary part of the country, especially when you consider those Declaration of Independence and Constitution of the United States debates um, and how South Carolina would not have confederated with other states in the Constitution had they uh, been forced to give up their slaves. Um, there are steps taken in the direction of this is in fact a good thing. It's not just a necessary ev evil, it's a good thing. John C. Calhoun proclaimed in 1837, or remember he led the nullification movement and was uh, Andrew Jackson's vice president. So in 1837 he says, many once believed that slavery was a moral and political evil. That folly and delusion are gone. We see it now in its true light and regard it as the most safe and stable basis for free institutions in the world. Now, what is he referring to? Uh, the freedom of uh, social mobility and such for those who can purchase and own slaves, but it's hilarious and ironic that he's using a term like free institutions while referring to an institution that holds others in bondage. It, it's just mind-boggling to us in the modern world that someone could warp their brain to truly believe these things. But remember what I said about uh, psychology, and, and we keep coming back to this in the course. Uh, you must psychologically justify to yourself what you are doing to other humans, 
if you are to not feel like an awful person. So most slaveholders um, found the legitimation of slavery in biblical passages. Um, and servants should obey their masters is, is heard in uh, the Bible, and they just kept harping on that. Uh, modern historians and biblical scholars would say uh, that that form of servant kind of slavery uh, was markedly different than American slavery, but that you could teach an entire course on that. Um, others argue that slavery was an essential thing to human progress. Um, the ancient republics of Greece and Rome and the great European empires of the 17th-18th centuries rested on slave labor. Uh, the ancient pyramids had been built with slave labor. So uh, slave owners are saying this this has been an uh, entrenched part of human history for all time. And um, slave owners actually claim that they are provi <laughs> providing freedom to their slaves uh, and, and giving them jobs to do on their plantations that save them from these low menial jobs like factory labor performed by wage laborers in the north. Um, so they were actually maintaining these slaves freedom. So here's a pre-Civil War engraving depicting this paternalistic ideal where we take care of our slaves. We're so good to our slaves. Um, and you can see here, you, you can't really read the writing, um, but there's an older slave uh, here in the bottom corner and he is saying uh, God bless you Massa you feed and clothe us and when too old to work you provide for us and the master is replying that these poor creatures are a sacred legacy from my ancestors and while a dollar is left to me nothing shall be spared to increase their comfort and happiness so this is supposed to depict, oh, slavery is actually just, it's such an honorable institution. Well, then you have Stark, in contrast, um, a, <laughs> an original painting called Virginian Luxuries, and this was <laughs> on the backside of a formal family portrait, um, and it shows these luxuries one is your sexual abuse of slave women and your ability to whip and beat your uh, field hand slaves um, so contrast this oh it's just so wonderful with this and yeah <laughs> it's it's all coming back again to psychological justification Anti-slavery sentiments grow. You can see off to the right here um, a children's book that was actually quite popular right through the uh, Civil Rights Movement. The story of Little Black Sambo. Um, the, the, you, you can't get much more racist than that. And, and we will see some more uh, references to this a term Sambo. Um, now, in the time of uh, the antebellum South, or just the antebellum United States in general, the term Sambo just referred to black slaves, and, and they didn't consider it back then a, a racist term. Even Abraham Lincoln used the term, and he says uh, on slavery, no one thinks of asking Sambo's opinion. Um, and he says, if he decides that God wills Sambo to continue a slave, he thereby retains his own comfortable position. But if he decides that Sambo or that God wills Sambo to be free, he thereby has to walk out of the shade, take off his gloves, and work for his own bread. So, long story short, yeah, you're going to find these ways to justify the slave system. Otherwise, you'd have to get off your lazy rear end and do the work for yourself. And so, needless to say, a lot of these slave owners conveniently thought that God willed Sambo to stay a slave. And there were even religious justifications for this wonderfully honorable system. Remember, honorable. I take care of them. It's so nice. Um, later in history, there's still uh, racist imagery, like I said, right through uh, 
the civil rights era and even into the late 1900s. Uh, the racist imagery of Sambo is used even for things like toothpaste. Darky brand toothpaste. It was, uh, it was owned by the Colgate-Palmolive Company. Um, it stopped being sold in the U.S. after the civil rights movement, but it continued to be sold overseas until 1989. Darky toothpaste. 1989. There's a Sambo restaurant chain, and um, it changes its name to No Place Like Sam's in the 1970s. Uh, but it was Sambo's prior. Uh, chocolate malted milk. Sambo brand. Um, children's games. Uh, smoking Sambo. Look at Look at that. And you toss rings onto the cigar. It's a children's game. This kind of imagery is uh, common right through, like I said, the civil rights movement so forget the fact that we're still talking about the slave system in the antebellum south this type of attitude lives long into the civil rights era so every single part of a slave's life is regulated not just their labor slave codes uh, cover everything from the proper way of speaking to a white person uh, personal relationships, like marriage, whether your uh, owner would allow you to have a marriage, formal marriage or not. They could not testify in court against a white person. So if a slave woman is raped, she cannot speak on her behalf in court. You cannot sign a contract, acquire property, own firearms, hold a meeting even, without a white person present. The, the, every aspect every moment of a slave's life is regulated and by the 1830s it's against the law to even teach a slave to read and write now some still did but it was illegal to do so so like i said uh slave children are often taught to read um so not all these things are enforced but um even the teaching of slaves to read though was was rare as a result of the law because over 90 percent of the slave population uh, is still illiterate on the eve of the Civil War. Um, in South Carolina uh, in the rice fields remember on the map I showed you the coastal rice fields owners sometimes allowed slaves to carry shotguns um, which is in defiance of the law uh, to scare off birds that are eating uh, the rice and rice seeds and um, it's pretty common for slaves to gather without white supervision um, on their day of rest on Sunday. So the extent to which these laws are bent uh, really depended on the decisions of the individual owners. If, the, if it was known that an owner trusted his slaves to be out and about in public, uh, then it would be uh, perfectly acceptable for their slaves to move about freely. One famous instance of the regulation of slavery under the law, it's a very sad story about Celia. She was considered to have committed a crime. She killed her master um, in 1855 while resisting sexual assault. Now state law deemed that any woman in such circumstances is determined to be acting in self-defense. But Celia, the court ruled, was not a woman in the eyes of the law. She was a slave whose master had complete power over her person, and the court sentenced her to death. Wrap your brain around that. She's not a woman in the eyes of the law, and her master had complete power over her person, and they said that it included sexual assault make things worse Celia was pregnant who knows it could have been her master's child Celia was pregnant 
her execution is postponed until the child is born so as to not deprive her owner's heirs of their property rights. This is disgusting, but unfortunately rather normal. We already talked about this uh, paternalistic attitude of masters over slaves. Uh, paternalism really is the Latin root for father. And here's a quote from a plantation owner. The master has a right to the obedience and labor of the slave, but the slave also has his mutual rights in the master. The right of protection, the right of counsel and guidance, the right of subsistence, the right of care, and attention in sickness and old age. So again, this puts a nice little shine on um, the slave system. Now this sounds really benevolent, um, but even people who treated their slaves what was considered nicely, lavishly, it was financially smart to care for you, decently for your slaves. So it's really more a business decision than a decision of being kind. Um, and this kind of thinking uh, allowed the masters to think of themselves as honorable people and that the slaves uh, were technically a part of their family. So the statistic you saw on the last slide that I intentionally skipped over because I knew this would be coming, um, in 1860, on the eve of the Civil War, it cost $1,800 for a prime field hand, which translates to $40,000 in today's money, uh, or 2017. For perspective, in the year 2017, that that comparison is made, you can get an entry-level Mercedes sedan for just under that. And if you add a few bells and whistles to it, you're very quickly uh, reaching, if not surpassing, that figure. So therefore, the comparison of a prime field hand worker to a uh, luxury vehicle like a Mercedes or a Lexus, this means that uh, any of the kindness that uh, slave owners tried to sell themselves as showing to their slaves was really more a business decision uh, to take care of a valuable investment than it was out of the goodness of their hearts. Now, slave life on a plantation, uh, food supplies, wild game, those are very abundant. Um, and it's good that it was because slaves had to supplement the food uh, provided by their owners, which was primarily uh, cornmeal or sometimes just raw corn that they had to grind down to cornmeal themselves and some salted pork or bacon. Um, now, they could raise chickens, vegetables and things themselves, animals that they hunted um, or maybe even stole from the plantation smokehouse. They could subside. They could they could survive uh, and feed themselves, and this is compared to the counterparts in places like Brazil in the Portuguese Empire, or the West Indies in the French and Spanish empires. American slaves endure, enjoyed better diets, uh, lower infant mortality rates, longer life expectancies, um, and the uh, biggest reason for this is the uh, paternalistic outlook of the planter class in the United States. The other thing, too, is that um, the uh, money that could be made off of the cotton produced in the southern United States was much more significant than the uh, profit made in places like the West Indies and Brazil where they were predominantly growing sugar. Sugar was an absolutely uh, in-demand product, but it wasn't nearly as lucrative and valuable as cotton was. So there was also the residual extra money to do such things in the American system than there was in the West Indies and Brazil. You can see some imagery here of slave quarters. Um, down here at uh, the bottom, there's a photo of uh, a vegetable garden 
um, as depicted at a historical site. The outside of slave quarters as depicted at uh, a historical site and the inside of slave quarters as depicted. You notice that they're just sleeping on the ground. There are no windows. Uh, this one is quite luxurious in the sense that there's actually a fireplace built into this one. Um, and it is not, it's very simple. It, it is not the nicest of conditions. Now, to maintain order, some owners would get the slaves essentially to like tattle like little children on each other. If they reported bad behavior on each other, then the one who reported the behavior could be uh, rewarded. Um, the owners sometimes incentivized a slave. Um, in one specific example, an owner provided 10 cents a day, which adjusted to inflation in 2015 is $2.75 to each of his slaves for good work. Seemingly small, this is quite an incentive to a slave who could spend that money on Sundays, their day of rest. However, as not physical as those incentives are, any infraction of plantation rules was within the right of the owner to be punished by the lash, so a whipping or a beating. Um, it could be used extremely rarely if you were an owner who didn't like doing that, or extremely often if you were a vindictive owner. Um, one Georgia planter, this is an example of uh, a, a silly reason for uh, lashing a slave recorded in his journal, this Georgia planner, that he had whipped a slave for not bringing over milk for my coffee, being compelled to take it without. So forgot to offer him cream, and so he had him whipped. Uh, depending on the owner, um, that could happen frequently or rarely. You see here, uh, flogging of a slave, flogging is another name for a whipping, who is fastened to the ground. Um, other times, slaves would be fastened to a post if they were going to be whipped. Um, this is uh, an extreme punishment, of course. The most common punishment, though, that was feared above all others by slaves is the threat of being sold away from your family. Um, so think of the people that you love most in the world. Imagine that another person has the power over you to sell them away from you forever. You will never see those people again. It's pretty gut-wrenching. It's, it's an awful thing. It makes you want to cry. This is the single greatest threat a slave has held over them. There is no whipping, no beating, not even a rape or molestation that could even hold a candle to the thought of losing your family. So when you'd love nothing more than to assault or murder your master for something that they had done to you or to a member of your family, the thought of protecting your family is what helped you keep your mouth shut and swallow your pride. And you can imagine how difficult that is. Here is a drawing that depicts um, a woman and her child who are about to be separated for the rest of their lives at a slave auction. This should tear at your heart. So, in the face of these grim situations, slaves actually succeeded in forging a somewhat independent uh, culture centered on the family and on religious services. This allowed them to survive this experience without completely losing their self-esteem and having something to pass on to their children in a series of traditions. African influence over their lifestyle is evident in music and dances being a part of their religious worship. Um, also, things like the use of herbs by slave he healers to uh, combat disease. Um, 
some whites, in fact, if you were a slave owner um, and you knew that one of your slaves knew just what type of herb to give someone when they were ill, uh, one of your members of your family was ill and a doctor couldn't even figure it out, sometimes, uh, based on reputation, these whites would reach out to these slave healers. And the dependence that these owners had on encouraging slaves to have families for the purposes of increasing their slave holdings. So again, another thing where uh, slave owners could uh, act like they're being nice to you by allowing you to have a family, allowing you to have a formal marriage, for example, maybe even your own slave quarters for you and your family. And that seems like so wonderful, so nice, but every one of the children that you and your spouse have will also be the slave holdings of that master. You can see here um, a painting depicting um, an evening fire uh, dance. Um, a lot of times the music that they sang uh, was very religiously themed and is actually the root of the genre of gospel music. Um, this all really dates back to this uh, slave culture that melded their former African traditions with uh, Christian traditions that had been put upon them by their masters. So, how did slaves resist? Um, the most common thing to do is day-to-day -day resistance, which is um, more commonly referred to with the term silent sabotage. So if you intentionally slowed down work, you intentionally broke tools, you intentionally faked sick so that you would end up uh, taking a day off, these are much more common. Much more rare is escaping uh, murder or even inciting a widespread rebellion. Um, why is this? Because harsh punishments, even execution, would follow after the fact. And you may be the slave who is made an example to the other slaves of why you do not defy the owner. You could be the one that is brutally whipped and beaten to uh, prove to others uh, that they do not want to uh, try these more rare forms of resistance. So, again, we keep coming back to psychological justification and everything. Um, if you remember our land is liberty concept as well, not just our looking back to psychology, but this phrase of land is liberty. We keep returning to this, and we will return to it throughout the course. What does the definition of liberty mean to the average citizen? Well, to Southerners, land and slavery was liberty. Slavery made possible uh, economic autonomy, uh, enjoyed not just by planters, but non-slaveholding whites who worked as overseers, slave hunters, etc. We mentioned this before. Even though they didn't own any slaves, any living that they could make was still somehow rooted in the slave system. And many Southern pastors actually uh, defended slavery, um, arguing that uh, this superiority was the fundamental law of human existence. Um, a hierarchy of ranks and orders in human society, insisted John B. Alger, a pres Presbyterian minister in South Carolina, formed part of the divine arrangement of the world. So terms like fundamental law, divine arrangement, God approves of this system. Again, um, this is the motivator, liberty, independence, self-sufficiency, but in the South, that also requires slavery, not just land. And to make yourself feel better about the way that you are achieving that, you have to psychologically justify your actions to yourself. 
So these two things, psychology uh, and the changing definition throughout history of liberty, are things that we will continue to return to throughout the course and discuss and how they have developed. This is the end of the Chapter 11 lecture. If you have any questions, by all means, reach out to me. Otherwise, I will see you in class.